Guys, I gotta tell you about the coolest film I've ever watched. It's called Hanabi, a Japanese action flick by Takeshi Kitano about a badass ex-cop who beats up or kills anyone who gets in the way of him and his dying wife Miyuki as they go on a trip together throughout Japan. Oh, right, and the ex-cop is indebted to the Yakuza, so he disguises an old taxi he bought as a cop car and robs a bank with it, and just drives off because no one's gonna stop a cop car, right? Anyway, so then the Yakuza come after him because they want more of his stolen cash, and every time he takes them out without breaking a sweat. I mean, look at this, right? This is the intro to the film. Look at how cool he is in this medium close-up reminiscent of the man with no name, followed up by him beating up some Yankee worker who disrespected him. We even get our first taste of the film's elliptical editing as the actual blow is cut out, so we're just hit with the full force of Nishi's power. R right, that's his name, Nishi. Oh man, and look at that color, the red saturated blood. It's not just in this scene either though, I mean look at the blood throughout the film. And not just the reds, but the blues too. I mean, look at how calm and collected Nishi is as he walks up to a car filled with Yakuza thugs, the deep blue of the winter coloring the scene only to further emphasize how stoic and strong this one-man army is. I mean, even earlier in the film, he doesn't even flinch when a thug pulls a gun on him to test his mettle. Oh man, and then there's all these shots of him alone and distinguished by the frame, representing the individualistic masculine power that Nishi possesses. And I mean, at the end of the film, it's just awesome, right? So he loads a revolver with two bullets as his cop buddies approach him. Oh, uh, but, but he doesn't shoot them. No, no, no. Uh, instead, he... As you very likely guessed already, I haven't been the most forthcoming about this film. I didn't lie though, I do love this film and I do think Nishi is cool. He's designed to be cool, his framing is meant to be cool, his actions are meant to be cool, but I've left out half of the film, Nishi's paraplegic partner, Haribe. This film is split in two, with us mostly following the actions of Beat Takeshi's character Nishi, with us intermittently cutting back to check up on Haribe and what he's been up to, which is mostly making these abstract pieces of art all of which were painted by Takeshi Kitano. Uh, it's the story of these two, Nishi and Haribe, and how they parallel each other and oppose each other that makes it one of my favorite films, and why I want to share it with you. I want to talk about these two and the masculine ideologies they represent when the dominant idea of masculinity begins to fail. So let's start with some context so you can go into this film informed about the masculine ideologies at play here. I'll be taking from Brian Baker's Masculinity in Fiction and Film, where he talks about the breadwinner hegemon, which was the dominant masculine ideal men were expected to uphold. The breadwinner ideal is based in its ability to provide for the nuclear family that they, the men, are the patriarch of. Now, Baker was establishing a masculine ideal in 1950s USA, and I'm talking about Japanese men in the 1990s, but much of Japanese social, economic, and governmental structure was affected by the United States post-World War II. Examples would be such as shifting from generational homes to American nuclear families, and governmental restructures to resemble their Western democratic counterparts. With these changes made to resemble the West, I don't think it's a stretch to apply a Western social hegemon to Japanese society in 1997. So what causes the failure of the breadwinner in the social consciousness of Japan, and that would be the collapse of their bubble economy, come the 1990s? As outlined by Ryo Kambayashi and Takao Kato in the Japanese employment system after the bubble burst new evidence, there was an expectation in Japan for lifetime employment essentially a cultural precedent that one would work for a company for a long time, and the company would provide for them. Come the 90s, this idea's foundation quickly crumbles as job retention rates drop significantly, about 20% for women and 17% for men. Needless to say, such a large increase in job loss in a decade following an economic period that was described by these economists as miraculous would heavily impact the social structure of Japan. With this massive loss in jobs, many men could no longer be the breadwinner of the household, and as a result, the masculine hegemon began to fail. And a reaction to it, and subsequent replacement of that masculinity must occur. Now, strictly speaking, in the film, 
Haribe and Nishi do not lose their jobs because of the economy. Though certain characters do talk about how difficult their lives have become in this recession, <laughs> Nishi and Haribe lose them either from emotional or physical trauma. Nishi, it's the trauma of his partner being crippled and another being killed, and for Haribe, it's because of his paraplegia that he can no longer continue being a police officer. Let's first establish and analyze Nishi's masculinity. As I've already established, Nishi is meant to be cool. The film's use of framing, costume design, color, and editing serve to focus on Nishi as a figure of masculine prowess, and how cool he is for having that. Color is incredibly important in the film, as the palette of the film is saturated. Every color pops out at you, and for Nishi, no color stands out more than red. The bloody spectacles of his actions are emphasized by how absurdly red the blood that flows from these people is. It's like they're bleeding paint. Elliptical editing is used to show off Nishi's masculine power, either cutting his blows out of the film to emphasize the bloody mess he leaves his opponents in, or cutting his fights short to show how easily he overcomes them. Other than that, he also just kills and beats up a lot of people without showing much effort. But what's the point of focusing on his prowess and violent power? It doesn't matter that he's so cool with the violence he can perform on the world if, in the end, he has to kill himself and his wife. He doesn't save his wife from her terminal illness by killing Yakuza. He doesn't even save himself. It's a masculinity founded in its ability to perform violence, and it's pointless. The film even says as much when an officer says how scary Nishi was shooting a corpse over and over. It's a masculine display that does nothing. He's frozen when he's faced with pivotal moments. When he's with a doctor telling him his wife's case is terminal, he doesn't move an inch. When he's with his dead partner's wife, he can't even speak to her. This whole violence-driven masculinity is a total facade. He's presented as this individualist in these long shots where he's separated from other characters or alone in the frame, but when he gets his hands on his money, his first thought is to use it to help those he could barely even speak to. He gives Haribe art supplies, he gives his dead partner's wife money to survive, and then he goes on a trip to bring his wife to see Japan. These are hardly the actions of an individualist man the film is trying to present him as, because that's what the film wants to emphasize, how this is all a surface-level lie. So then, what does Haribe represent? Well, he's... Haribe is Nishi's counterpart in the film, and we're constantly cutting back and forth between the two, following Nishi's physical journey through Japan and Haribe's journey through the art that he makes. Haribe's art is cut between Nishi's violent escapades, employing elliptical editing to emphasize the art, and also connected to Nishi's violence, placing these two masculinities at odds. The paintings are abstract and modern, countering Nishi's traditional Japanese iconography, such as temples, Zen gardens, and Ryokan, which cements Nishi as the older masculine response of violence, and positing Haribe's masculinity in creating art as the new masculinity. To be clear, Haribe's masculinity doesn't circumvent violence. It's simply that instead of performing violence like Nishi, Haribe depicts it. While some of his art merely has a violent subtext, depicting animals with their heads replaced by flowers, other pieces are far more overt, such as the one with the bright red kanji for a warrior suicide, Jiketsu, which later has red paint splashed on it in an elliptical cut from Nishi pulling the trigger on a gun, leading us to think that Haribe has taken his own life. See what I mean about the blood being red like paint? But that's precisely the point. We're meant to believe that he took his own life, but the reveal is instead he depicts it with the red paint splash on his art. Nishi takes the lives of himself and his wife because his masculinity of one performing violence, but Haribe doesn't have to take his own life because he depicts violence instead of performing it. Instead of harming the world around him, he creates art. Nishi, on the other hand, is so entrenched in performing violence that he enacts it on the world even when he might not want to, as shown when he tears and breaks a girl's kite. This is Nishi's first blow to her innocence, the second being when he takes the lives of his wife and himself in front of her, scarring her. Nishi performs violence, and as a result, scars the world around him. Haribe depicts it, 
saving himself from Nishi's end. Color also works to parallel these two, as while Nishi gets his bright red blood, Horibe receives even more. His paintings and surroundings are decorated with vibrant colors from flowers and greenery and from his own paintings. Though this vibrancy is present in Nishi's shots, especially during his travels around Japan, Nishi can only paint with red. Haribe's masculinity allows him to do so much more. Another counter is Haribe drops the facade of individualism. The inspiration for his work is clear. He paints flowers after he is shown kindness by a woman. The close-up to her exposing this intimacy emotionally for Haribe that Nishi is denied with his long shots. Haribe is privileged to have his inspirations shot so close up as flowers riddle the film. On top of all that, the film imitates paintings as there are many lingering shots in the film that evoke the idea of one. I'll come back to this later. This film is about discarding the traditional violence-driven masculine identity and it does so beautifully by placing an emphasis on it adding a lure to this traditional masculine identity by making it cool and stylish but ultimately useless and juxtaposing it with a newer artistic masculinity. The film begins with a montage of Haribe's paintings and bookends itself with a final painting past the credit sequence precisely because this film isn't really about Nishi, it's about Haribe and his art. But there's also another layer to the film that I think serves to further this idea of a new masculinity in art and avoiding violence by depicting it in a very metatextual way. The movie's directed by Takeshi Kitano, the art is made by Takeshi Kitano, but Nishi is played by Beat Takeshi, and I even referred to them earlier as if they were different people. But aren't Beat Takeshi and Takeshi Kitano the same person? The answer is yes and the answer is no. Strictly speaking, yes, they're the same person, but Katano does a few things in his films and his other works to problematize this, frankly, normal assumption. Daisuke Miao outlines this in B. Takeshi vs. Takeshi Katano, as he points out that as a director he credits himself Takeshi Katano, but in his acting roles as Beat Takeshi. Miao reads this as Katano using the televisual body of Beat Takeshi as his prop in his films. I want to take this reading further and apply it directly to Hanabi. See, a few years prior to this film, Katano was involved in a motorcycle accident which he later stated might have been a suicide attempt, though he isn't even sure of that. Miao reads it as a possible attempt for Kitano to kill Beat Takeshi. This is a film about art and making art to avoid that masculine trap of violence. I think that Nishi, as credited, is representative of Beat, his violence being the same kind Kitano, or possibly Beat, used on himself, and Haribe represents Kitano in this situation. After all, films are a form of art. It's a piece of art about making art, and art is scattered throughout the film, either the paintings we cut back to made by Takeshi Kitano, or other artworks that fill the movie's mise-en-scene. And those pauses the film makes, the shots that it rests on, well, like I said earlier, they feel like a painting. I think this film represents Kitano's answer to himself about what to do with beat Takeshi, to keep making art and not perform violence, to make art about violence as an alternative. Though as a good scholar, we must take this reading with a hefty grain of salt as this directly dips its toes into psychoanalysis of films, which is dubious for multiple reasons. I mean, firstly, it falls under auteur theory, which, despite films being a collaborative effort, ascribes the director as the ultimate and only active agent in a film's creation. Though, since Takeshi Kitano both edited, wrote, and directed this film, there's a bit more leeway for auteur theory here than usually. Secondly, it presents the film as somehow being reflectant of the deeper psyche of the director, even in ways that they aren't necessarily aware of. You know, it's, it's stating that films are the ego and id made manifest, and not a deliberate piece of work that contains themes or ideas that don't directly reflect the personality or worldviews of the director. It's a more subtle but equally absurd analysis as saying a director who makes violent action films is themselves a violent person just waiting to kill people. So keep all of that in mind when you go back and rethink about this section of the video.
This film is about making art and using that to express yourself and introducing it as an alternative form of masculinity to one that relies on destruction and violence, no matter how outwardly attractive that original masculine idea might be. And that's a message I want to spread. Depict violence, don't perform it. That said, this movie isn't perfect. As Rie Karatsu points out, the film privileges male perspectives and action to the point of enforcing negative social roles of women. It treats its female characters poorly. Nishi's wife, who is a good woman in the film, is quiet, submissive, and only speaks two lines, thank you and sorry. Arigato. Even her outfit when they go traveling looks like a school child's clothes. So a good woman is infantilized and a non-agent in life. Miyuki's even deprived opportunities to speak because of this traditional idea of Ishin Denshin, also known as On no Kokyu, which means to be so in tune that words don't even need to be used to communicate. That's why she doesn't speak, or anything, it's because her male counterpart simply knows all of her whims and demands, and of course she has very few. The other good woman in the film, she's just cute and kindly gives Horibe flowers. So a good woman must be cute, and quiet, and childlike. The bad women, on the other hand, are ugly, as Horibe describes his wife, the film's bad woman, as a dog even before she leaves him. So an ugly woman is bad with no qualities that should make you even like her. Because she's ugly, she's selfish and heartless. So the film does enforce rather strict roles and expectations on women despite trying to be so liberating for men. Why do I bring all this up? Well, because that's the thing about analyzing films and anything that you love critically. You gotta keep your mind open to what isn't so great about it to acknowledge it and challenge it. That's how critical analysis should work. <laughs>